Good evening, Bible study, Calvary Baptist Church. I'm excited. We're back in-house. We've got people around us. We've got excitement. I can just see it over your masks. I know that more and more of you are becoming, um, I, I keep using the word inoculated, but I think we use the word vaccinated. I'm not sure what the difference is. So let's have a word of prayer. We'll get into our Bible study. Uh, for those that are joining us at home, or join us later on YouTube, and we'll get into our study. So let's have a word of prayer. Father God, tonight, in the most powerful name of Jesus Christ, we come before you as your children. We come together as believers in you. Father, we stand in the grace of God, and we thank you for grace, and we thank you for mercy. Father, tonight, as we delve into the Old Testament, we look at your prophet Elijah and some of the people that were around him. Father, help us to learn from this and to take what we learn and apply it to our everyday walk. Father, I pray you'll open our hearts and our minds that we would have understanding and wisdom as we go forward. Bless those that can't be with us this evening. Bless those that are watching from home. Bless those that see this later. Father, may your word go out and achieve what you send it to do. And it's in the powerful name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Well, tonight we're going to continue with Elijah. How many of you have been enjoying Elijah? How many of you have been watching Elijah? <laughs> okay. So we're going to continue with the second epoch in Elijah's life. And this is going to be a two-part teaching because I want to take a, a side road. There was too many verses for me to cover in a short span. You know how I am. I don't really like to hit the high spots. I like to dig in and, and pull out some things that, you know, maybe we've missed through our life or, or have forgotten. And, and let's, we'll plow some, some different ground. So we're talking about Elijah, who was a prophet uh, in Israel. And I've got, a, I've got a graphic up there, and I don't know if you can read it in here or not. But we're looking at about 885 to about 874 with, with Elijah beginning his ministry. So we're talking about 885 years before Christ. We have the life of Elijah. Now we're in the divided kingdom, so we have Israel and Judah have split because of the way uh, Solomon's monarchy was as soon as it was over with, the kingdom split. So you got the northern kingdom and you got the southern kingdom. Uh, ten tribes in the northern kingdom called Judah, I mean called Israel, two tribes in the southern kingdom called Judah. So you got Israel and Judah, um, and they had multiple kings from here on out to the end. Uh, 722, the Assyrians came in and took the northern kingdom away. And then 585, uh, Babylonians come in, took the southern two kingdoms, and they were, they were in captivity for, for many years before they came back. And so this is just kind of running up to God basically kicking them out of the land. They've begun to uh, entertain Baal worship at the time. And that's one of the problems with Ahab the king. Ahab married Jezebel, and we talked about her a little bit last week, and, and she was, she was a, 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 a bad queen. She, she had all these different gods she worshipped, Baal and Ashtoreth, or Asherah, uh, it's said different ways. And, and so they were beginning to bring in Baal worship into the land. Now, at this time, a lot of the Israelites also worship Asherah. They have found recently, um, in digging around, they have found idols to Yahweh and his Asherah. And so, you know, I, I, Yahweh has no Asherah. Yahweh has no female consort. So you can see it's called syncretism. And, and, and syncretism is a blending of multiple religions taking what you like from the different religions and making your own. And that's very popular today. People are mixing together, even, even dealing with what, what they call themselves, I don't know why I do this a lot, but neo-pagans, they'll mix together some of the Egyptian pantheon of gods, they'll mix together some of the Greeks, some of the Roman, they'll mix together some of the Irish gods or the Celtic gods, and, and they create their own religion with all these blended gods. And the same thing was going on then. They were, they were mixing the one true God, the worship of Yahweh, which they were informed of his name, um, when Moses was at the burning bush, the, the one and only true God. Well, by this point, all these years later, um, after the reign of David, um, I mean before the reign of David, this is all going on. They were begin, beginning to split. So um, let's go on and go to the next slide. So tonight we're going to be looking at a couple places. We're going to be looking at Samaria and Mount Carmel. Now there's where Samaria is located on the map. Um, and this is a place we know well. Jesus ran into the woman from Samaria. And, 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 and Samaria is important in the Old Testament even. You remember the place where Moses had the, the tribes split up and get on two mountains. They got on Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim. And on, on Mount Gerizim they talked about the blessings of God. And Mount Ebal they talked about the curses of God if they did not obey the commandments of God. And so they would chant the blessings and cursings off these two mountains. Well... When Jesus is talking to the woman from Samaria, she says, you know, we, we worship on this mountain here. And, and she's looking at those mountains. They were considered holy mountains to the Samaritans. So, so we're looking at Samaria, which is where Ahab had his palace. 
He had a palace at Samaria, so that's why we're going to look at that. And then Mount Carmel, you're familiar with, it's, it juts out into the Mediterranean, Ocean, Mediterranean Sea there, and it's where Elijah had his confrontation with the prophets of Baal and Asher. And we won't get to that actually tonight, because there's so much to unpack in there that I'm going to take a little more time with that uh, next week. So, we have a black screen, that's good, that's what I want. Okay, so let's, let's start tonight reading in, in 1 Kings chapter 18. Verses 1 and 2, it says, After a long time, in the third year, the word of the Lord came to Elijah, Go and present yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the land. So Elijah went to present himself to Ahab. Now, the famine was severe in Samaria. Remember, I told you a minute ago, Samaria is where Ahab was at. That's, that's where he had his palace. And that's where the famine, remember, three years, no rain, no dew. And remember, Baal was a god of rain, storms, dew, fertility, life. And so this is one of the things that God does is he, he takes what they're worshiping and shows them that there's nothing there. Because this prophet of Yahweh, which he's one of the very few left in the land, said it's not going to rain for three years. And it didn't. And that's God showing his power. But we, you can also see the mercy of God because he's allowing this to go on as long as he has. He finally, at this point, does, does the three years of no rain. That'll get everybody's attention. That gets everybody in the land's attention. So this is where we're at. We're three years in. Hasn't rained. And, and Ahab is, is out actually scouring the countryside. He and Obadiah, his right-hand man, his chief administrator, a guy named Obadiah. Now, it's not the Obadiah that wrote the book. There are actually, uh, one commentator I read said there's 16 different Obadiahs found in the Old Testament. And, and there's a possibility that all of them are different people. So um, it's kind of hard to trace this. So, so King Ahab had a right-hand man, his, his chief assistant that was, remember how Joseph was the number two in the land under Pharaoh? Well, this guy's number two in the land under the king, Ahab. And, and so the northern king, the top ten tribes, this, this guy, Obadiah, uh, a Hebrew, is his right-hand man. But Obadiah is a God-fearer, and we're going to look at him just a little bit tonight. So jumping on down to verse 7 and 8 and then verse 15, it says, As Obadiah was walking along. Now, now here's what happened in the interim there. King Ahab says, we've got to find some grass. Otherwise, I'm going to have to start killing my livestock. And I don't want to kill my livestock. I don't want to have to kill my cows. So let's go find some grass. And he wasn't worried about anybody in all of Israel. He was worried about his own livestock. He didn't want to start having to kill them because they were starving. So he gets Obadiah together, and they decide to walk through the land. And they go two different directions. And so King Ahab goes one way, and, and Obadiah goes the other way. Well, while Obadiah is walking, he runs into this guy named Elijah. Remember him? He came in. He came to Samaria. He prophesied it's not going to rain for three years, and then he disappeared. Remember, God told him to go hide by the brook Cherith, and then he moved him to Zarephath at the widow's house, which is right in Jezebel's back door. I mean, right in Sidonia, where her father was the king. That's where God hid Elijah. And so they've been looking for Elijah. And, and in those verses, I kind of skipped over, and we'll get to them in a minute. They've been looking for him, looking for him, looking for him. And listen to what happens. As Obadiah was walking along, he was looking for grasses for King Ahab's cattle. He said, Elijah met him. Obadiah recognized him and bowed down to the ground and said, Is it really you, my Lord Elijah? So he sees him as, and the Lord here means master. It's a term they used all the time. He's not praying to him. Uh, even though he bowed down, he's, he's showing reverence to a man of God that Elijah was. Remember, Elijah just showed up at the very first of chapter 17. So now we've gone through chapter 17. That's all we know about Elijah, really. And now um, Obadiah sees him, recognizes him. And he replies, yes, go tell your master Elijah is here. Well, remember what God told Elijah, it's time to go present yourself to Ahab. He's been hiding him out, tucking him away, taking care of him by the brook, and then took care of him at the widow's house. And then he says, okay, it's time. Now's the time. Go present yourself. And then jumping down to verse 15, because here's what Obadiah does. He says, I'm not going to do it. You're, you're going to disappear again. Now remember what Elijah's known for. He showed up. He prophesied. They couldn't find him for three years. And Ahab had every country around him looking for Elijah. And as a matter of fact, when they said, Elijah's not here. We've never found him. He made them swear an oath to him that they're telling him the truth. Because he wanted Elijah. He wanted him alive to, to fix this. So it's amazing to me that Ahab never gets it. Never understands that God is doing this. And the prophet of God has spoke the word of God. And, and Ahab, what's he want to do? He wants to harm Elijah. And Jezebel was mad at him too. And you know she's going to be a real problem. Um, not next week, but the week after. Elijah says, because Obadiah says, I ain't going to do it because you're just going to disappear. He said, the spirit of God will wish you away again. I won't know where you are. And I'll go say, Elijah's here, 
and you're not going to be here, and I'm going to get in trouble. So Obadiah was kind of afraid for his life because he's a right-hand man to the king. Elijah says, As the Lord Almighty lives, whom I serve, I will surely present myself to Ahab today. So, so you see it's coming to a head, and, and we're going to see this come to a head on Mount Carmel. But, but here's this guy, Obadiah, that we don't really know a lot about. He's an interesting guy, and we're going to look a little bit more at him a little bit later. Um, and, and here's what, when, when Elijah runs into Ahab, here's what he tells him, verses 18. He says, Now summon the people all over Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel. Now remember when he says all over Israel, he's not talking about all of Israel. He's talking about all of the ten nations, the ten tribes up north. So at this point, so you see Israel, you've got to remember, we're not talking about the man Israel. Jacob named, renamed Israel. We're not talking about the whole twelve tribes. We're talking about the ten northern tribes. It gets kind of confusing. One of the things I'd like to do when we get back into going is I have a chronology of the Bible that I like to teach. And what we do is we take a timeline. And we go through the timeline and we look at what's going on. We look at dispensations, how God is working with the people, who the major players are all along the timeline so that we have a grasp. And, and you'll be able to say, okay, I'm talking about Abraham, so I'm talking about 2,000 years before Jesus. Or I'm talking about David, I'm talking about 1,000 years before Jesus. All that plays a role because 1,000 years takes place between Abraham and David. So it's important to know a timeline. And so, uh, and you know who's Israel at what the different times are. But, but going on, it says, now some of the people all over the Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel. And bring the 450 prophets of Baal. So that's how many prophets of Baal there were. And the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. So now picture this. We have a king of Israel, God's nation. You know, the ten tribes belong to God. A king marries this pagan witch of a wife who has, who serves the prophets of Baal and the prophets of Asherah. There are 850 of them that she's keeping up. Now, what's interesting are the prophets of God um, have been disappearing. They, they, they disappeared from the land under, under Jezebel's hand. And so they've actually had to go into hiding. So here's what, here's what Elijah says. Go get them. Go get them all. Let's meet on Mount Carmel. And Ahab goes along with it. Ahab says, okay, we'll do that. See, Ahab was, was a king, even though it was a king of God's country, he wasn't sure who was God. He, he wasn't convinced. You think, well, why would he be so stupid? I mean, God has shown himself so strong to the people, to the, to the nation of Israel, to the 12 tribes. How can they ever halt or waver between the two? But don't, but don't we see that even today? Don't we see, you know, the goodness of God's hand on America? And we're kind of not where we need to be in America. Would, would I at least get a murmured amen with that? I mean, we, we've kind of stepped away from who we are. And, and we argue about, it. you know, well, none of this stuff matters, or that doesn't matter, or you can't force me to do this. And, and so, you know, we need, and, and, and I've, I've been dealing with this in, in just in my own life, thing, you know, we need revival. I, well, every time I turn the news on, the only thing I say is people need Jesus. I mean, they, need, they really need Jesus, not just church, not just going through the motions, but they need, they need a life-transforming interaction with the holy risen Savior. Amen? They need that real life that Jesus offers, that everlasting life. But it's not everlasting life sometime in the future. It begins now, amen? How many of you's lives have been changed and blessed since you come to know Jesus as your Savior? And, you, and submitting to him and walking by him, even when it doesn't make sense. Even when you think, I'm wandering in the wilderness, and I shouldn't be because I've obeyed God. And, and we know about it, Joshua and Caleb, they wandered for. 40 years as well as the rest of them. God took care of them during those 40 years, but they had to wander too, didn't they? So sometimes we as Christians, we're in a tough place. We, we may end up in a wandering. We may end up in a holding pattern while God's preparing. We may be living through the drought as Elijah did. Remember what happened with Elijah? He had so much faith in God <coughs> that he prayed it wouldn't rain, and God told him, okay, now go, go by this brook Cherith. And he goes there. And what does Elijah watch for however long he was there by that brook? Let's, let's just say a year and a half to two years. We don't know. What did he watch that brook do? He watched that brook get smaller and smaller and smaller. And God said, I'm going to take care of you. He had ravens bringing you food. He said, you're going to be able to drink from the brook Cherith. And he's there and he gets smaller. And you, you, ever, you ever know you're where God wants you, but the brook is drying up? You ever, you ever know that and you think, well, where's the brook? I, I, know I'm, I know I'm where I need to be. I know I'm in God's will, but the brook's drying up. And, and don't we kind of get the same way? Sometimes we look and we say, wait a minute, did I misunderstand? You ever second guess? Maybe, maybe I've missed something. In the ministry, I've done that multiple times. Uh, 
I tell people all the time, every Saturday night I quit the ministry, and every Monday morning I was excited about it. Because I'd go and preach, and I enjoyed it, and God showed up, and God showed out, and I loved it. And so, yeah, I'm back in the ministry on Monday morning, but every Saturday night I was ready to quit. And, you know, because sometimes the, the, we, we allow our brooks to dry up, or, or, or we let the wrong things come in and keep us from staying by the stuff. See, the reward is promised when? After we die. We're, we're, we, we have everything provided, but, but the inheritance is when? In Christ after death. And so we're strangers and foreigners here, aren't we? We're just passing through. We're going to live for eternity with, with Christ Almighty. And so while we're here, we're going to be by brooks that dry up. But when we get there, the brook never dries up. There's a, there's a stream that comes from the throne of God, the Bible says, and it's full of smallmouth bass. Somebody say Amen. <laughs> I had a friend of mine that we used to go fishing a lot. He said, I can't wait to get to heaven and fish. He said, can you imagine the lunkers? I said, every cast. Every cast, there's another lunker. Every cast, there's another lunker. I don't know if there's fishing in heaven, but I believe there is. I, I think Peter still fishes, amen? Probably does a good, time, good job every time he goes. So, so this is what's going on. Now, Elijah, when he was by the brook and it dried up, that wasn't, God wanted him to be there until the brook dried up. Did God know the brook was going to dry up? Sure. Completely aware the brook was going to dry up. But he also had another situation. He was setting up with this widow up in Zarephath, right in Jezebel's backyard. And so you see, God was preparing ahead of time the next place. And when the brook dried up, God came to him again. I would say the day the brook dried up. Just about the time that Elijah's getting real good and thirsty. Now, I just want you to know I'm preaching. I'm not telling you what the Bible says right now. I'm, I'm inter interpreting, uh, interpreting even. Probably by the time he got good and hungry, good and thirsty, he thought, well, my brook's gone. But he was still by the brook. Because where did God tell him to go? To the brook. And the brook dried up. And then God came to him and said, I got another place for you. I've set a widow to take care of you. He's thinking, okay. Let's set a wealthy husband. Let's set a lot of money. This God's going to hook me up. It's going to be great. He gets up and what is she? Broke. <laughs> she's so broke, she's out trying to get a couple sticks to make a little fire. So she can cook this little handful of meal with a little bit of oil she got left to make a bread for her and her son so they can die. And that's where God sends Elijah. Wouldn't you be just excited? <laughs> really? This is where you want me to go. But think about it. In our own life, in, in our own ministry, sometimes we find ourselves in a place where there's no provisions. There's, there's just enough every single day to make it. It's kind of like the manna in the wilderness. Nobody that went and collected a lot collected too much. Nobody that collected a little bit collected too little. God provides everything you need. Now, a lot of times he won't provide our wants because our wants are not according to his will. A lot of the time, sometimes they are. And we're told if we pray according to the will of God that he'll meet our need and he'll supply our... It's when we get our will in the right place. When our will lines up with his will, then we're asking for the things of God and he provides those freely. So a lot of times we're asking for things that are not good for us. And you've heard me say it before. I used to ask God for a great singing voice. I love country music. But I know where I would have been if I could sing. Probably not in church house tonight. Probably not at a, at a prayer meeting tonight, right? And so it's, it's, good, it's good that I can't sing uh, because I put too much value in that in my younger life. And that's not the case because there's a whole lot of people that are out there the term honky-tonking tonight. So um, some, sometimes people do that and, and they do all right. But not, I know I wouldn't have. So, so this is what's going on. He's wanting to call them together. So let's look at verses 20. So Ahab went throughout all of Israel and assembled the prophets on Mount Carmel. Elijah went before the people and said, How long will you waver? Like the King James says, How long will you halt between two opinions? If the Lord is God, if Yahweh is God, follow him. If Baal is God, follow him. But the people said nothing. They were not convinced. They had forgotten the stories. They had forgotten about the Red Sea. They had forgotten about the walls of Jericho. They had forgotten about walking across the Jordan River dry shod in flood season. They had forgotten about the manifold blessings. They had forgotten about the manna in the wilderness. They had forgotten these things. And we're going to see next week that there was an altar on the top of Mount Carmel to Yahweh that was torn down. They had forgotten God. That's why they were in the mess they were in. They had forgotten God. 
They had forgotten the hand of God. They'd forgotten the blessings of God. They'd forgotten the goodness of God. And they had turned to Baal, the, the God of the Canaanites and the Phoenicians around them. They, they had come in and done exactly what God told them not to do. They intermarried with those people in the land. Because God says you, you cannot intermarry with them. And it wasn't about mixing the blood. It was about mixing syncretistically the, the religions of the land. And Solomon was king of that. He would marry all these political alliances and bring in those brides and they had all kinds of different gods. And he'd build them a place to live and he'd build them a place to worship. In the holy land of Israel, King Solomon did this. Well, it's no wonder that by this point, they're a mess. It's no wonder by this point, they've forgotten about David and his reign. They, they have forgotten about the goodness of God because they had walked away from God and things began to get sour. And then they wanted to be like the people around them. Well, we'll just worship. You know, these people seem to be doing all right. We'll just do what they're doing. And that's what's happened. And so, so here we are in the land of Israel. We have Ahab, a wicked king. He is so wicked. In, in, in chapter 16, it says he was more wicked than any king that came before him. He won the title wickedest king. That's no title to have, is it? And he was king over God's people. With a wicked king, you end up with people who no longer walk after the Lord. Now, there was always a remnant. Amen. Aren't you glad God never leads himself without a witness? And one of the things that we're going to find out about Elijah is Elijah was a little bit whiny. He thought he was the only one. He said this to the people. Then listen with it. Then Elijah said to them, I'm the only one of the Lord's prophets left. Now Elijah's going to say this more than once. He's going to say this to God on the mountain of God. When God says, Elijah, pack your bags and come to the principal's office. And God, and God sends an angel to him. Gives him a cake. That's another message. We're going to get to that. But, but he says the same thing to God. I'm the only one left. Doesn't God correct him? He says, I've got 7,000 more that haven't bowed their knee to Baal. You're not alone. Can it seem that way sometimes? Can it in our Christian walk seem like nobody else is doing what's right and just don't want to stand? Now, I'm proud of Elijah here because Elijah's standing when others won't. Remember, all the people of Israel said nothing. When he said this. He has them all there. On top of Mount Carmel. And we're going to look at that. But I want you to see this guy named Obadiah. Now Obadiah gets a bad rap by a lot of theologians. Um, I read a guy named F.B. Meyer today. And F.B. Meyer says that Obadiah was a bad guy. That he had no spine. He had no background. He had a yeller streak. Y'all heard of that? that? That he was not a good guy. And I thought well I don't agree with that. It just doesn't seem that way to me. And then I read Charles Haddon Spurgeon, and Spurgeon says, Obadiah was a good guy. He was where God wanted him, doing what God... He was a rescuer. You've heard of the Underground Railroad. Well, a lot of people would say the people of the Underground Railroad, according to that kind of logic, were not good people. Because if they were really good people, they would have been fighting as, as an abolitionist, or they would have been doing more than they were doing, just saving the one life here and the one life there in a hidden kind of fashion. But sometimes the only way we can operate as Christians you know about Corey Ten Boom, right? Sometimes the only way we can operate as Christians is by saving the one Jewish life, hiding them in a, in a hidden room in our house, or, or, or by taking a, a, an American slave and hiding them away, trying to get them north one at a time. And isn't that work valuable? That work is valuable. Now, aren't we glad for the Elijahs that come along and they stand bold and they stand proud and they've got the power of God on them and they begin to preach and people begin to get right? And we're going to see when we come back next week that on Mount Carmel we see God show out in a mighty way. But there's this guy over there that we know nothing about. He just shows up in this little brief text. And listen to what it says in 1 Kings 18, 3 and 4. And Ahab summoned Obadiah. Now this is before they go out looking for the grass. To his palace. His palace of ministry. That's who Obadiah was. Now it goes on. We have a parenthesis here. It says Obadiah was a devout believer in the Lord. Now what else do you need to know? He was a devout believer, and that's all capital Lord, Yahweh. He was a de devout believer in Yahweh. While Jezebel was killing off the Lord's prophets, Obadiah had taken 100 prophets and hidden them in two caves. Now, there are over 600 caves in this region. Over 600. I didn't do the math. Somebody else did, and I'm quoting them. So if it's wrong, I'm going to blame this other guy. But he hid, there are 600 caves, so he hid in two caves 100 prophets of God. Fifty in each cave, and he supplied them with food and water. We have an underground railroad going on. When Elijah says, I'm the only one. Remember that a minute ago? Elijah says, I'm the only prophet left. Well, we know of 200 right here. 
And the Lord later on, I mean 100, and the Lord later on will reveal that there's 7,000 that have not bowed the knee. Bowed the knee. There's 7,000 more followers of God. Here we have 100 prophets of Yahweh hidden away in two caves being fed by man, even though he's high in administration. I don't know what it's like to feed 100 prophets. I've tried to feed a couple preachers before, and I, you can't afford the chicken. It takes a lot sometimes to feed us preachers, doesn't it? And so this Obadiah was a God-fearer, right? And he had done this. And so we have this little parentheses right here. He supplied them with food and water. Obviously, it was taxing him. He couldn't do anything extravagant because if he were found out by Ahab, what would happen to him? Jezebel was killing the prophets. What do you think she would do to a man running an underground railroad for prophets? Well, she'd have him killed. We know what Jezebel does. We've read other stories about her. And then when Elijah comes to Obadiah, he says, go tell Ahab that I'm going to see him today. And then Obadiah says, yeah, I don't think I'm going to do this. You've been known to disappear. The last time we heard from you was three years ago. And nobody heard a thing from you. We've scoured all of the lands around here looking for you. Obadiah says, what have I done wrong? When, when, he, when Elijah says this to him, go tell Ahab. Go find Ahab, tell him I'm meeting today. He says, what have I done wrong? Why, why are you singling me out that you're handing your servant over to Ahab to be put to death? He knew what would happen. As surely as the Lord your God lives, there is not a nation or kingdom where my master has not sent someone to look for you. So the spies of Ahab were everywhere looking for Elijah. They just didn't know look in Jezebel's backyard. That's where he was hiding. And whenever a nation or a kingdom claimed that you were not there, he made them swear that they could not find you. So, so he made them swear an oath to him as a king. He's not there. And so you see, here's this, here's this servant, Obadiah, that gets a bad name. And I've heard a lot of sermons that Obadiah gets a bad name because he was a coward. He didn't stand up. He should have stood up like Elijah. But I want you to understand that God places people where they need to be in positions of authority where they need to be so that they can do God's work and it be unnoticed. Just like in Nazi Germany, just like with the Underground Railroad and, and Slavery America, and all those things, God has his people and they're hidden. They don't get any accolades. They don't get any rewards. They, they live a life of, of, of ducking and hiding and running. And, but you know, if, if that's the ministry God has for us, it, if we're the last generation that's ever going to be Christians on this earth, if, if it's all just going to go, because, you know, Jesus says when the Son of Man returns, will he even find faith? And the way the Greek is constructed, it has to return a no answer. He says when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith? So we know things could get worse, right? But you know what I believe we need? I think we need another great awakening. I think we need a, I think these people need Jesus. I think our Christians need another shot of the Holy Ghost. Amen? Some of us have to be like Obadiah and work for our master and be no accolades, no notice, but we're saving a life at a time or a hundred at a time or we're just investing in it. Sometimes I think we, we, we lose sight of the small picture trying to get a view of the big picture, but we can't really get a picture of the big picture, can we? We can't really see all of God's plan. But we can sure tend the field he's given us. Amen? And most of us, we know where that field's at. It's pretty close to this church. Within a few miles, right? Most of us are in this area. And we're to be salt and light in the darkness. What well, goes on in, in verses 11 through 14, he says, But now you tell me to go to my master and say, Elijah's here? You've been hidden? He's had everybody looking for you? And now you want me to say, hey, he's here? I don't know where the Spirit of the Lord may carry you when I leave you. Because he knows what happened before. And I, and I like that because he has such faith and belief in the power and the majesty of God that he knows the Spirit of God could just take Elijah anywhere. And we see that in the New Testament with Philip. He goes down and preaches to the Ethiopian eunuch. He baptizes them. When they come up out of the water, Philip disappears and shows back up where? Samaria. Isn't that interesting? God sent Philip to Samaria to preach. Oh, it, just, it ties together. The whole Bible ties together. He says, I don't know where the Spirit's going to. If I tell Ahab and he doesn't find you, he will kill me. Yet I, your servant, have worshipped the Lord since my youth. God had somebody on the inside. Obadiah was God's man on the inside. And Obadiah was a man of God from his youth. Elijah couldn't see anybody else but himself. I love the Bible because it shows the flaws. It shows the faults. It shows the sins. 
it shows that nobody's perfect but Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. But God uses the imperfect. What's the old saying? He doesn't, he doesn't call the gifted. He gifts the called. Obadiah was a man that served God from his youth. He says, haven't you heard, my Lord, what I did while Jezebel was killing the prophets of the Lord? I hid a hundred of the Lord's prophets in two caves, 50 and supplied them with food and water. And now you tell me to go to my master and say, Elijah is here. He will kill me. Now that's where he gets in trouble. A lot of people say Obadiah was more afraid of his life than doing the right thing. And that's where people kind of come down on him. But, but they kind of leave out the, the hundred prophets that he fed and took care of. But we don't know for how long. We don't know how long he was giving of his own resources in a secret way to make sure that God's prophets. I mean, if you want to pick on somebody, pick on the prophets that are hiding in a cave. Amen. You got, you got prophets. This guy, is he just works for the government. But he's a believer, which goes to show you, God may have you in an interesting post. You may be surrounded by unbelievers, and you can work behind the scenes, and God can use you mightily. You may never stand in the pulpit. You may never have a bullhorn on a street corner. I always roll my window up anyway. When I get around a preacher with a bullhorn on a street corner, I roll my window. <laughs> it's a little unnerving, but I mean, it, God blesses those ministries in a lot of ways. You may never do that. You may just simply give somebody a glass of water in the name of Jesus. Jesus says, you'll get a prophet's reward if you do it in his name. Obadiah served faithfully, even though he was in a bad situation. Even though he could have lost his life at any time. And he was afraid of Elijah here because Elijah was a little bit off kilter. You just know what Elijah was going to do. He'd come prophesy. He'd come from nowhere, prophesied, disappeared, and exactly what he said happened. Didn't rain for three years. He's a little bit afraid. He was afraid he'd lose his life. I kind of get that. I kind of get being afraid of your life. I've known of missionary stories when they're looking at the barrel of a gun, when they're just leaving the country. They've served their whole term. They're leaving and looking down the barrel of, of, a, of, of a gun and say, deny Christ. And I know of missionaries. I've read their accounts where in that moment, when they were almost home, almost back to their family, and they denied Christ. Now they never got over it. It haunted them until the moment that I heard their story. They were still talking about how that haunted them. That doesn't mean that God throws away everything in that missionary. God doesn't throw us away for that. God, God's not in the business of throwing people away. God uses us mightily and we never know what we're going to face. Obadiah, I didn't know a lot about him until I started deeper into this study. You know, I'd read about him before and most of the people I read didn't like him. But the more I read about him, the more I can identify with Obadiah the more I can say, that's a real ministry. That's a real... He kept a hundred prophets from starving to death with bread and water. He said, well, that's not fine eating, but it's eating. Amen? Amen. And God blessed Obadiah. And we don't hear anything else from him. We don't know anything else about this Obadiah. That's it. You've heard everything we know about Obadiah. But I, be, I would like to meet him. I believe we will one day. Do y'all? I believe we'll meet him one day. And we'll find out... The rest of the story. Amen. Well, that's all the teaching that I have for you this evening. So I want to leave you with that. I want to have a word of prayer. We'll turn the cameras off. And I'd like to have some discussion, some thoughts, and then we'll share a prayer request. And then we'll leave as soon as you all are ready. Okay? Let's pray. Father God, tonight, I want to thank you so much for Obadiah. I want to thank you for that faithful who, man who followed you from his youth and feared you and did the things that you asked him to do. Father, tonight, I pray that you would... Send Obadiah among us. Father, help us to be the people that do the work of the ministry without the accolades. Father, we thank you for the Elijahs too, those that come onto the scene and bring revival. Father, we would pray for a revival to begin in our country. And Father, may it begin tonight. May it begin with me. Father, may we turn back to the truths of your kingdom. May we serve you and worship you in boldness. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen.